Welcome back friends, I hope you're having a fantastic day. I'm enjoying my long weekend here where I live, and we have a lot of work to do with this video. We have to take care of decals, some more construction steps, and, of all things, an oil dot filter. A technique that's usually used on armor models, but we're going to use it to weather this small French World War I aircraft. So pour yourself a glass of Bordeaux, and let's get cracking. The first thing we have to take care of is the decals, and as there are not a lot of them, and the process is fairly straightforward, I'm going to take this time to talk a little about the aircraft. As I mentioned before, it was not very good. In fact, it wasn't very good at all. It was plagued with many problems, the biggest of which perhaps was the big casserole spinner in front of the propeller. This was installed to increase the aerodynamic qualities of the aircraft, but because it used a rotary engine, which required air cooling from the incoming air, the spinner directed a lot of the airflow around the engine, causing a lot of overheating problems. The aircraft was also warp wing, which, like a lot of those types of aircraft, were pretty stiff on the controls, but the machine gun that it was also equipped with, the French Hotchkiss machine gun, was also not very reliable when it came to fire rate, so it was impossible to synchronize it. Thus, deflectors were mounted on the propeller in case the bullet hit the propeller, it would just bounce off, which created a lot of unnecessary vibrations in flight. That and the cockpit was also incredibly uncomfortable for anyone over 5'6", so this one goes up for all the short kings out there. Lastly, this monoplane design with a pretty short wingspan resulted in very high takeoff and landing speeds for the time, which was undesirable for a lot of the pilots at that time. In the end, only 49 of these aircraft were ever produced, and it was quickly outclassed by more superior designs. As you could see at this point, I decided to assemble and paint the landing gear, which... I don't know, I just... I, I wanted to get it out of the way. Then I painted it all with Vallejo Black, and I also used this opportunity to touch up on the black outlines around the control surfaces on the tail. Once that all has been completed, it was time to seal the decals with another coat of clear varnish and prepare everything for oils and weathering. So as I mentioned before, I'm going to try to put an oil dot filter on this aircraft. My selection of colors for the plain fabric base coat was as follows. Olive green, faded white, ochre, burnt umber, and bitume, which I used very sparingly because it's a dark and powerful color. Oil dot filters are usually used to create very subtle color modulations on the paint job. In this case, the selection of colors would depend on what colors would work with the color of the model. However, what I'm doing is not exactly a filter. The idea here is that a light colored aircraft like that, especially in the conditions that these were kept during World War I, we get very, very dirty and grimy. Thus, I'm blending the colors a bit less than you would normally for an oil dot filter on, say, an armor model, to create stains, dirt, and all that good stuff. So after blending all these colors with a brush dipped in enamel thinner, I had a little oopsie moment because, well, the olive green was overpowering all of the colors, and the result is, well, very, very green. Looks like some marshy water, which is not good at all. So after blending it more with a dry, soft brush, I added a bit more brown colors, and that fixed the problem. The result now was a more balanced filter of all of the colors that we applied, and I was happy with the result. When it comes to weathering with oils or enamels or whatever, you'll notice I like to work in smaller sections. That way I can have my full attention focused on one part of the model, and I also don't have to worry about paints drying up faster than I need them to. I applied less paint on the wings than in the fuselage as you can see, but I also concentrated more of it around the root of the wing and where it meets the fuselage. This is because a lot more dirt would get accumulated in that corner right above the landing gear than on the edge of the wing. The landing gear would also kick up a lot of dirt too during landing and takeoff, so there's that. 
I didn't really touch the red or the blue parts of the roundels, however I did put a little bit of a paint filter on the white. Just because it would never actually remain in this pristine white color when this aircraft was so incredibly dirty. Okay, phew, that was a lot of blending. Let's take care of some more weathering effects now. Using a bitume color, I added castor oil staining on the bottom of the aircraft. As far as I'm aware, this was fairly common amongst all rotary engine aircraft, especially French ones, as they used a total oil loss system, which means the excess oil and exhaust would all be spat out of the bottom of the engine, creating these wild streaks on the bottom of the aircraft. Before I put my oil paints away, I want to paint the propeller though. So first we have to base coat it in white. I'm using an acrylic color here and the point is not to get even pretty coverage, but just to create a light nice base coat for the wood effects with the oil paints, which I find very very important. Now according to reference pictures, the propeller was just of a single dark color. There was no additional wood linings like on some German propellers. So I mixed up a chocolate brown color and carefully painted the propeller. The important thing here is to keep your brush strokes vertical as if you were following the wood grain of a wooden plank made into a propeller. Okay, now it's time to take care of some of those surface details made out of photo etch. They were all painted black so for easier gluing and painting I decided to airbrush the whole photo etch fret at the beginning and then touch up any flaked off paint with a paintbrush. Some of those details included the tail skid which I glued on with some super glue and the machine gun magazines which I touched up with brass from Vallejo. Two of them I glued in the storage container below the machine gun and then I folded and fitted the feeding system in place. Lastly, I mounted one of the magazines into the machine gun. The instructions call out for some scratch building, so with the help of some stretched sprue, I attached the tail skid, then painted it with the same shade of wood color that we used for the propeller. Once the oil dot weathering that we applied earlier has dried, I was looking at the model and the decals were giving off a little too much sheen for my taste, so I used some flat varnish to kick all of that down. I also clear coated the propeller blades because we'll be attaching decals to them later on and I really didn't want to apply any decal solutions straight onto the oil paints as they aren't very resilient. Now that all of the airbrushing for this model is finally done, we can take off all of the masking tape that we applied earlier. But let's finish up the propeller before we go anywhere further. I glued the bullet deflectors on the propeller blades and then I attached the back blade of the spinner. The fit on this part is not that great so I'd highly recommend using some slower setting super glue so you have time to correct any mistakes. Then any paint flaking on the metal parts and the deflectors were all painted in silver from Vallejo. The last details on the propeller are the decals which I carefully applied and used a very sparing amount of setting solution to make sure not to damage the oil paint underneath. After that they sit in so well that I didn't even need to varnish the propeller afterwards, They just the film completely disappeared over the glossy surface. And now here's some footage of me trying to get the warp ring controls in place. Okay, now as I was airbrushing the interior in the last episode, I accidentally yeeted off this little piece of photo edge off one of the sides of the fuselages. So I'm gonna have to scratch build it now. Using a sheet of styrene, I cut out a little piece, matched it exactly so it fits the original part face. And then after I glued it in place, I drilled little holes in it with the smallest drill bit I have. 
This is very hard to film, so this is just a visual representation of what it's like, but yeah, there are very shallow holes in it now. Using some gunmetal pigments from Uptitling 502, because my hobby shop didn't have any MIG ones in stock, I applied them to the machine gun, and that creates a slight metal sheen that differentiates it from the black cowling. After that we can safely and carefully glue it in place, put some tiny extra thin, and then do some final touch-ups with black paint. Including painting those two little strips on the sides of the cockpit, one of which we had to scratch build a moment ago. And that's gonna be it for today, we only have the rigging left and we're gonna take care of that the next episode. Honestly, I'm absolutely loving how this thing is turning out so far. It manages to display the very sort of battered and, and worn filthy look that I was going for from the start, and I'm really enjoying it. The rigging will make it look even better as it tends to add a lot of volume to World War One subjects. But what do you guys think? Leave your thoughts down in the comments below and give this video a like if you enjoyed it or a dislike if you didn't. And subscribe if you haven't already, because next episode will be all about rigging and all of the challenges that it poses. Thank you so much for making it to the end of the video, I really do appreciate it a lot. I hope you enjoyed the video, even learned something new, and I'll see you guys next time. Peace.